today, you know, I want to talk about guilt-free coding. Um, well, is it just a way to get over any guilt you might feel doing your job as a developer? And it, it doesn't matter if you're a hobbyist, you know, if you just code on the weekends, you can still feel guilt by doing this and not feeling up to scratch. And what, what I want to sort of get everyone to agree on is that, sorry, two seconds. Is that, you know, it's okay to struggle at your job. You know, that's, that's probably the most key thing, you know. Struggling at your job doesn't mean you're bad at it. It just means you've hit a point in which you've got a challenge, and, and challenges is important in your life to learn and grow. Now, I think it's important in the whole room that we can all agree that happened to at least one of us at some point. Um, and to sort of get that across and get people in sort of the, the mind frame of sharing, I'm going to get people to put their hands up a lot. So it's only the start of the talk, and I know everyone's tired, but just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you a question. It's not going to make you do anything else. I'm not going to pick on you specifically. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few feelings that I've had or experiences that I've had over the last few years. And if you can relate in any way, just put your hand up for a second. You know, I'll say, can anyone relate? Put your hand up for a second. And I'll just get a good vibe of what's actually happening in the room. Uh, and to sort of like make it fair, I'll share something about myself before you share about yourself. Um, I mean, about two years ago, I hit quite a low point where I got really stressed out, as Rachel was saying, on a project. It got really bad to the point where I was so stressed. I mean, it, it, essentially, I'd, I could nearly cry randomly in days. That makes no sense. I'm not, I'm hoping not the crying type, really. But, you know, I didn't really know what to do with it. And luckily, my girlfriend's uh, a psychologist. And she said to me that, you know, this is, there's, there's a lot of help out there for this kind of stuff. Uh, and I was encouraged to see a counselor, which was an awesome thing to do. Uh, I'd highly encourage it. And there's a lot of stigma to say that you've seen a counselor because it sounds like you've got some wrong way. But really, I just needed someone to talk to for a little bit to try and help me figure out what was going on. Um, yeah, and as I said, it was an awesome experience, but pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so the first of these experiences I've had is, you know, feeling the need to use a particular tool. So, you know, you could be quite happy in using MUMP, which um, if you, most people probably heard of in this room, which is just a simple way to set up an environment that you can code in on your computer. It's so easy. It's like probably the first tool you ever use. There's this equivalent on uh, Windows, which is WUMP. But then, you know, Trends are changing, and people are talking about Vagrant. And like a few years ago, Vagrant was becoming this cool thing. Everyone should use Vagrant. Now, you might not be comfortable with it, but you feel the need to use it. And that because you might see some tweets, someone saying, oh, yeah, Vagrant's the best thing ever. Got to use it. Or even worse, that your boss turns around and says that everyone in the company now needs to use Vagrant, uh, which I did to people, uh, ironically. I told everyone we should go on Vagrant. Um, and what, what we found was basically people were just sat there struggling all the time. You know, They were sat there spending half a day trying to configure this thing that they have no idea and have no interest in using because they didn't make that choice. I made that choice for them. And the same effect can happen for Twitter as well. If they're feeling like everyone else is doing it, they'll have to do it. And that's, that's one of the key points. Now, can anyone relate to a similar experience where you thought you've had to use a tool? See, that's a lot of people in the room. And like, that's a terrible thing to feel. You know, it's, I don't think many industries can relate that way where they're forced into doing something they don't want to. Another one is feeling overwhelmed by a piece of tech. And this is a little bit harder to explain. It's like, I think the best one is, because Git's probably mostly used in this room. There'll be a lot of people. If you're not on it, that's fine. It's not a big deal. But the ones who are on it, you know, I'll use it every day. And what I've learned is, you know, I know how to commit. I know how to push. I know how to merge. Right? That's all I know. I'm like the only developer left in our office that still uses like a GUI interface, because I don't know the command lines for it. And like, if it breaks, I have no idea how to fix it. Like, literally, if we get to a situation where someone just goes haywire, I don't have the knowledge of how Git actually works to fix it. So that's me being overwhelmed by a piece of tech. You know, I'm, I'm basically fluking my way to use it. You know? And the best example of something like this where it goes really wrong is that um, we host a lot of stuff in AWS, um, like scalable WordPress sites, where they can scale up boxes as they get bigger. Now, I was the one who wrote all the stuff for doing it, um, and I spent quite a bit of time learning it. But I realized recently that I don't know enough to get away with it because the client site went live. and. Well, essentially, if anyone's heard of Composer, which is where you can pull in dependencies, made a change in how it works. So I wake up the morning off their big announcement, and Amazon recycle boxes, so they get rid of one and add a new one. And the idea behind it is that it won't remove one unless it's healthy, the one that's coming along. But there's a little bit of a glitch, and the new Composer stuff was broken. And what it done was it disconnected all the servers and just left an empty load balancer up there, which basically means a white screen. And the site went down. And I had literally no idea. I knew what the problem was, but I had no idea how to actually fix it. And it, it, it actually turned out that by clicking random buttons on the panel, it fixed it. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of embarrassing. 
So, you know, we're tailoring that back a little. I have some, some things to learn about AWS before we start pitching it to every client. But, you know, that's cool. That's being overwhelmed by a piece of tech. What do we think? Have we been in that similar situation? Yeah. Good. We agree. This one uh, might not relate to everyone, but I feel quite lost at the minute with the amount of files that we have. Like, we have editor configs, we have like your gulp config, we have package JSON. I don't know, the list keeps going on, right? And every time you start a project, you're like, right, I need to take those 20 freaking files that ever seem to be in every single project with me. And so I copy and paste, right? Which is clearly me not understanding it, because I don't know what all the folders and files do anymore. And I, I, had, I had to screenshot my recent project, because it's starting to take the piss now. Like, what is this? I don't know, it's not the best screen this, but you can just see on one file, like, this is getting more and more confusing. And like, who isn't lost in this? Not, you can't tell me that you know every single one of those files. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a waste of time. Can we read it to that as well? Maybe not as many. Ooh. Don't boo me off stage. Uh, okay, well, let's move on to something that's a bit more common. There's, you know, feeling intimidated by an older developer. Um, I think this must happen to everyone at some point. You know, there's, there's people out there that are quite overly opinionated. There'll be someone in this room as well. It's not a bad thing to have an opinion on a topic and tell people about it. But at the same time, if you're sat in the office and someone comes in one morning and says, right, you know, this is the right way to do something. Like, we should all be doing this. Well, maybe that's not the way you used to do it. Now, you'll probably just be like, I don't care, I'm going to continue to do it my way. But if they keep coming in every day and seeming so confident and so sure that it's the right way, at some point you're going to be sat there going, maybe I don't know what I'm doing because this, this guy comes in every single day or this girl comes in every single day and just seems to know exactly what the latest piece of tech is and why we should be using it. And that, that sort of wears away at you a little bit. Can we relate to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> Less hands. People are getting bored of hands. Don't worry, there's not much left. Um, and the other side of this, which it's kind of related, is you know, being, feeling confused by the information about it by a client and, and client developers as well. Um, if you're in your job, right, and let's say we're all at WordPress experts because we're here today, um, you know, people just assume you're going to be able to sort everything out. So if you're asked to come in and fix something that's small, you'll just be like, OK, right, I know what I'm doing. I'll come in and do it. The problem is you don't always get everything that you need. And you get in these situations where perhaps your boss just assumes you can fix stuff. And I don't know, we've had it where the client won't give you the database. And you're like, OK, well, I can't set up a local version of that, so I'm not going to fix your site. And then you go for this hassle of trying to explain it. And sometimes it looks bad on you, even though it's not your fault. So like this whole day of you back and forth and talking about a database when you could have got it from the very beginning um, can look bad on you. And I think the best experience that I can describe of this is that um, recently we were asked to do a project. And we were put in touch with this team. They had an internal dev who had spent two weeks trying to fix an issue. And he made it sound like the most complicated thing ever. Like, I swear, he's talking about all these sorts of words I've never heard of. I was like, geez, this is going to be the hardest thing in the world. And I, I was like, we'll just, we'll just spend a few days on it and see what happens. So it took two days to get all the information off him. It, like, I got all the information. I sat at home because I was, I was writing some of these slides as well at the same time. And I got all the information arrived in an email. I met a coffee before like, I go diving into it. I was drinking my coffee. I was like, I better know what's, what's wrong with it. It's invalid XML. So I pasted it into the validator, checked it, it was invalid, and I just wrote like, a thing that just finally replaces the invalid tags, and I uh, sent it back to them in 10 minutes. So it was a 10 minute fix, but it took their internal developer two weeks to waste time, two days of my time being wasted, and then 10 minutes being actually fixed the problem. Can we, can we relate to that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other side of this is, like, I, I really think this happens to a load of people. It's kind of embarrassing in some ways, but like, Feeling unsure of your decisions is like, in the most simple form, is that not knowing what to call a variable. Like, you're like, don't know what that variable should be called. Or maybe that variable name is not very clear anymore. And you sit, you sit there and you're just like, you could spend 10 minutes like, trying to decide what a variable should be called. It's weird. And the other one to that is like, the, the public protected stuff. Like, you know, you write your class or your map inside your class, you have to decide where it's public protected. And some people are like, where's private gone? I was told recently you're not allowed to use private anymore. So I've removed that. But you know, it's like, I'm going to make all my stuff public because I don't care. Like, unless you're going to code review it, you're never going to know if it's public or private. So it doesn't really matter, does it? It's like these are, these are little things. And I, I understand logic. You know, I've been to university that go through the, the theory behind why you do this stuff. But in the grand scheme of things, like on every site you build, this stuff's irrelevant nearly. And I think so you should just take that attitude of like, it's really not the end of the world. If it's public, you can come back to it. Can we agree with that? A little bit of me. <laughs> Maybe I lost you on the public private. Um, okay, so we're done with the hands, so it's fine. Don't worry. For the rest of you can sit and relax. So, you know, each of these little problems aren't that bad, really. Like, you know, you go in, you have one of those problems, you'll leave work, and you'll just say, like, to your other half or to me, like, geez, I can't, today was bad. Like, I had this person who's the right idea. 
And that's the kind of stuff you'll talk about and you run over, over a beer or whatever. But, you know, if it happens loads and loads, like repeatedly, that's like small digs, right? And, and the best way to explain this, like, so like, this is probably my second talk that I've really done to a decent sized audience. Now, if one of you heckled me right now, no, very nice crowd, but you could have heckled me, right? Someone could have said, oh, this is boring, mate, right? I think someone said, yeah. It's very mean. Uh, I'll be doing a, a guilt-free speaking one next. So the thing is, though, like, that would probably knock me a little, but not stop me from speaking. I go to an hour conference, and then if someone else done it again to me, then I start to worry. And then in, by the time I do a next talk, if someone started yawning, I might already panic because I'd be like, people hate me anyway. Now there's someone yawning, I've done something wrong. And the same thing happens in your development. You know, you keep getting these little digs at you, and eventually you start doubting yourself. And that self-doubt is really dangerous. So you're probably like, well, you called it guilt, and now you're talking about self-doubt. And yeah, they are linked. But I think we need to like, focus exactly on um, wh what is guilt, because it's a kind of weird word. You know, like, a lot of people right now in this room will be like, oh, yeah, you can be guilty of a crime, or you can feel guilty because you've done something wrong. Like, I don't know, you've you done something bad, and, and you pissed your mate off, and you feel guilty for doing it. And that's the two sort of common things. But actually, when you, when you read the description, it's really obvious what guilt actually is. This is brilliant. I find this. Um, so, guilt it occurs when a person believes or realizes, accurately or not, that he or she has comprised his or her own standards of conduct. And that's really important. So, like, first off, it's accurately or not. So, it doesn't mean it's true. You can still feel guilty even though you've done nothing wrong. The second to that is, like, this standards of conduct, it's your own standards that you believe you're breaking. So, it's really important to figure out what your standards are. You know, you set them, so you can set them lower if you feel like you're always breaking them. That's the, that's the point here. You control the bar. So keep that in mind as we follow through. Now, like this feeling of guilt um, leads to the self-doubt. So it's like the bit before the cycle. You know, you're working, this guilt feeling comes along. As a result of guilt, the self-doubt grows. So that's where it's from. And now, if we want to remove all the self-doubt, we have to strip out the guilt. If you no longer felt guilty, well, you wouldn't be worrying about stuff anymore, and your confidence will slowly grow back. So if you can let go a little and you just enjoy stuff, you'll become a little bit more confident over time, and you get to that point where you can probably take the odd little digs so you don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. And it's by building that sort of like confidence level back up in who you are as a developer. And like, how do we do that? Okay, so you gotta stop listening to other people. I know that's ironic because I'm telling you this, uh, <laughs> but it's after this talk you need to stop listening to everyone. So yeah, it's like, Forget what other people are telling you. You need to create your own standards. And then you live up to those standards. And that's the bit. So we need to just figure out what it is. And I think the best bit about this industry is there's no accreditations in the grand scheme of things. It's not like people in this room are going, I spent seven years getting my accreditation, which means that you know, I'm officially a member of whatever society to do this job. No. I mean, most people don't even go to uni for it anymore. No one has a PhD. So you could do it if you wanted to. But the point being is like, you, know, you have like 17, 18 year olds who do some of the most amazing work now. And like, that's awesome. So if there is no official standard, then we can go wild with this and just make it up. So before I give you some guidance on the rules that you should use, I want to talk about some of the areas that can affect you day to day. You know, things that, things that will cause you to worry about yourself. So I describe them as like the three main causes of confusion and self-doubt. And the first one though is like a really important thing is being part of a team. And I think it's really, it's really beautiful to be part of a team. It feels great, you know, it's like, we, we have some people here from Big Bat as well, and like, we'll go out later and we'll hang around and we'll talk, and it's, it'll be a really great weekend, and that's a real beautiful part of being a team. They're there to support you. On the other hand, everyone has different personalities, and it's really hard not to let that affect you. Like, everyone's different. And I've already talked about that over-opinionated character, and we all have one in the office. It's just natural. And actually, generally, the, the, the younger devs, that they're over-opinionated, it's confidence, you know, you come in, you're cocky, that's just the way it is. And you get, you know, you lose that as you get a bit older. But some of the other ones to watch out for is, you know, you, you've got people in, in your office that will be slow, very slow, to the point where, like, it's painstaking to watch them code, because you're just like, how can you be that slow? <laughs> right? And the other end of the spectrum is you get the person so fast, it just sickening, because you're like, I don't, I don't know how you built that that quick. Now, the problem is when you start pairing people together and you've got the slow and fast person, they'll just go at each other because the fast person's probably cutting, cutting corners or doing messy stuff. The slow person's probably doing really good code, but it is slow, you know? And it's like that kind of mix. So you, if you can understand that you're working with the fast person and there's a reason they run fast and you can understand where the slow person, you can kind of get used to it and realize why, you know, it's not something to do with you, it's to do with them. It's understand their personalities. 
Um, in our office, I'm the person who cuts corners. That's my job, I think. You know, I'm the one that will just kind of take on a random project and just cut as many corners until it's fixed. You know, that's not, you know, I'm not trying to be the best developer in the world. I'm just trying to do my job. And like that, I think that I like that. That's, that's who I am. I've gotten used to that. But there's other dangerous personality types that go with conflict with that, which is like someone who likes to refactor or do things always the right way, has to be the right way. And we have someone in our office that does that. And like sometimes I'll code and I'll pass it over to them and they'll start refactoring my code. And I'm like, like, that's like them saying my stuff's not good enough when I'm writing. Now, I realize that that's that person's personality type. And they don't mean anything by it. They just like doing it. It's like something they want to do. They'd rather spend an extra half an hour on a night so they could make sure it's tidier for themselves at a later date. So that's just a good quality to be as a developer for them. But they need to watch out that they're not hurting someone else by doing it. Because if I hadn't understood that as who they were, I would take it as an insult. And moving on from that, I know we're at a conference, so I think it's quite important to talk about this. And it's not the, it's not the organizer's fault I had to put that in. I was worried I'd get told off if I didn't. Um, but it puts people in like awkward situations where they can be shamed for like a choice, a technology choice, or a decision they made. So like, the best example I could give for something like this is like, if I asked everyone in this room what like IDE they're currently using or text editor, um, and we were all sitting around a table and just having a laugh, maybe we're in a bar, just having a beer and there's six, seven of us, there's a good chance I'd say most people are going to turn around and say Sublime and Adam. I think it's pretty common. Now, there'll be a few people that are not on that. Now, there's probably one person in this room that might be as mad and they're coding on Notepad++, and if you're still doing that, great, because like, you've made your own rules up and you're using them, and that's great. But if we're in a bar situation, there's a high chance that someone might laugh or make a joke about that person using Notepad++. That's not very fair. Now, I know it's meant to be a bit of banter, you know, and developers do do that with each other, but that, you know, we have to be more mindful not to do that to someone. So if you're in a situation where someone laughs, you should just be like, just say to them, that's, that's not cool, mate. You know, like, this is my choice. Um, I've seen this done really horrible to someone before when I've been out with a load of founders from different WordPress agencies and um, one of the slightly larger WordPress agencies made it, made it, kind of made a dig at one of them, one of the smaller ones, you know, and it felt more of a personal attack because it was one person on another person and I just thought, like, what are they getting the benefit out of attacking someone? So, like, if someone ends up attacking you, um, if it happens tonight, come get me. Uh, I'll be at the pub. <laughs> but apart from that, you know, just say to them, like, what, what's, your, what's your jib? Why are you attacking me for? You know, like, you know, what kind of person goes out of the way to hurt someone? So keep that in mind. They're not nice people. And then the last one, this is a pet hate of mine, actually, because, like, I love Twitter. It's probably the only place you can find me. Uh, I, like, I don't reply to emails, really, but I'll probably tweet you back. I don't really use Reddit, but I know a lot of people do. Um, but the side of that is that, like, it's a lot about people just shouting these, these newly found opinions. It's like, um, you know, they'll read, read an article. Uh, maybe they read an article about testing one day, and they were like, this testing's awesome, and they get excited about it, and that's cool, because you should be excited about new, new innovations in our industry. But what they'll do is, they'll read the article, they haven't used any of this tech, they'll probably tweet, that they, how can you develop without testing, right? And they've only just read an article. You're sat there drinking your morning coffee, and you see that, and you think to yourself, I don't know anything about that, I didn't even know that existed. And you start getting loads of these tweets from different people, and, you, and like that stuff slowly wears down on you, and you see it coming from all angles. But like, you don't know for a fact they're definitely using that, like a tweet, doesn't mean anything. And like, I've, I don't know if you've noticed the trend. Like, I see a lot of people who definitely retweet articles that they've never read. Like, that's why share buttons have moved higher up the page. So you can just tweet it. It's mad. So like, don't take anything from Twitter. Like, whatever people say on Twitter, it doesn't matter. You know, I still think you should use it to ask questions. I think it's a great source of like, you know, if you're just like that lazy web thing where you're just like, you know, does anyone know an idea about something? Um, I know like Mark, who's in the audience today, he does a lot for like React at the minute. He'll be like, how do you do this? And like, it is quite useful for that if you know someone in the area. <laughs> right, so let's define some rules. I'm going to give you a couple. You don't have to use them all, but it might give you an idea of what maybe you should start doing, especially if you are struggling a little bit in the minute or you are feeling a little bit worn down. Uh, right, has anyone heard of this one? This is a military thing. Actually, the English one's proper because they don't like using prior. I think it's like wrong English. But I leave this is one I used to be told a lot. Uh, I heard this in CX, I used to work in a shop, and um, my boss would be like, you know, prior preparation prints per performance. And I'd always be like, great. I was like, you do realize I work on a till? There's not really a lot of prep for your till. <laughs> you know, you, I was like, but you love saying it anyway. It's just like one of those things. But like, it's, a really good, it's a really good one to remember. And as it relates to our industry, I think it just means that like, before you start a project, you should be doing some research, you know, figuring out your workflow, figuring out your environment. Just do a little bit of planning. I mean, um, if any of you have attended, you need to learn programming. Like, they make you write it out in paper first. You know, you do like pseudocode stuff. Um, and it's, it's mental, because you'll be sat there for four hours writing out a bit of thing on a bit of paper, and you have to type it into a computer, and it feels really weird. But like, 
I think there's a lot of logic in that. that I think that they were trying to teach you something that I didn't quite get back then because I was younger, but I think it's just about taking your time and discussing it before you actually jump on a computer and get a bit overwhelmed by it. The next one is KISS, right? This is not an older military term. It's not, I've never been to the military, obviously. Uh, but keep it simple, stupid. Uh, this is actually said in our office a lot. I don't know, people might find that offensive to say stupid to someone, but it's more of a, a, a joke in some ways. Um, it's just about not overcomplicating your code. It's about making sure that you take some of the easier routes. It doesn't always have to be hard. Um, you know, the, the things we hear at the minute is people, a lot of people say, you know, um, code for the future. I hear that a lot now. Like, you make the code, make your code super extendable so that it'll work for whatever scenario in the future. But, you know, realistically, if you like write a big PHP script and it's over five files, it's all split out, it's really, you know, that single purpose for a file or whatever, and you guess the wrong future, it's going to be a lot harder to refactor. You know, if I write it in five lines and I come back to change it in two years, I have five lines to fix, not five files. And I think that's really important, you know. I think that, that the idea behind that concept of making your code uh, future proof is great, but in theory, it's a lot harder to do, and you probably don't have the time to be doing that kind of stuff. The, the one of the best scenarios I have for this is um, we were working with DigitalOcean, uh, not that as a company, but just using DigitalOcean as API to build servers at one point. Um, and it is an API, and there's an API wrapper for PHP, so you just pull that down in Composer, and then you just use it, right? That takes two seconds. One of our devs decided to write his own wrapper for their API and using the REST API. Like, that's... That was like a, probably a week's worth of work he did, and within six months it was broken because obviously when they changed their API, I can't do Composer update his package because he's not maintaining it. So he overcomplicated that for no reason. Like, but you've got you've got to learn that mistake on your own. You've got to feel bad before you realise that like you shouldn't overcomplicate it. So yeah, just keep it simple, stupid. Now this one's actually from Facebook. I don't know if it's as well known, but it's like slow down and fix your shit. Um, Facebook used to say uh, move fast and break stuff. And that broke a lot of stuff, so they changed it to this. <laughs> so, uh, I think really, you know, you, you just need to take your time and make sure your code works. I would rather uh, be a little bit slower and make sure some works. Like a lot, a lot of developers don't fully test what they're building. Like they'll test it in a really isolated edge case. Like you know, I run, click this button, but they build it, so they know which buttons to click, and they don't try any other circumstances. I think like to build your confidence up, you should test your code a little bit more because if you, if you have better experiences with clients and them not saying, oh, that doesn't work. Because that gets stressful. Once it goes to the client and they say it doesn't work, you can get in that rushed mode of going, oh no, I need to get this working. And it's like, I need to fix it fast. Whereas if you just wait a day or two and done it properly, when they get it, they're just happy. It's an easier way around. Um, I don't actually know who you said this, so I'm going to say my parents made it up. Well, everyone's parents made it up. But um, like you've always heard this like tidy home, tidy mind. So I have like tidy home, tidy code, tidy mind, right? It's quite a common thing. It, I'm quite messy, so I figured that's why my mom used to say this a lot to me. Um, but yeah, if you write really tidy code, it's easier to come back to, and it's worth taking that time to do it. And now you'll have heard all about like PSR and WordPress code and standards, like Dave was talking about earlier, and like they're really important. But if you're finding it overwhelming to learn something like that, create your own standard, and all it is is consistency. So if you put a space after an if, or you drop the bracket or whatever, just do it that way. Once you start doing it, just come up with your own standard and keep doing it, because. Um, I tried to copy Laravel's coding standard in Herbert and accidentally did it wrong. So someone actually went, oh, I've mimicked this, the Herbert coding standard, so I have my own coding standard. I, it was a mistake, and like, I kind of think people don't know if it's intentional or not, as long as it's consistent. So that's how you map that tidy code idea. Uh, this is really important, just make a start. Um, if you're getting like, to that point where you're struggling, you should just make a start, any start is better than no start. So um, whatever it takes, Right, this name at Poo is because of the thing earlier where we don't know what the name stuff. Now, in my very first web programming job, uh, the previous developer left. I was given a WordPress site. He was actually one of my first WordPress sites I've ever worked on. And I just found a variable called Poo. And I was just like, what does Poo do? <laughs> and I was like, I don't really know today what that did. Now, he probably left it in uh, uh, by mistake after he was like testing something. But like, it makes me smile because like, this, this is a guy that was like, like a lead dev effectively. And he was just like, coding some Poo keep on going, like think of any thought. And like uh, any time I get stressed out about naming and stuff, I think, well, he called that poo, so as long as mine's better than poo, I'm doing all right. <laughs> so always remember that. <laughs> so, you know, refactoring is quite a big topic we hear about these days, and I think people really do need to embrace it. Um, and the reason you should embrace it is because it kind of gives you like a second pass. So you can say, I'll code this now and I'll get it working, uh, but it doesn't look great, but I'll come back and fix it. And it is a lot easier to come back and fix something and like make it tidier. Um, the second time round, you know, it's when you've got the full picture, it's easier. Now, 
there's a game at the minute, I don't know if people have seen this on Twitter, where um, developers aren't allowed to use temporary variables. And the idea is you write a piece of code, and then you get your mate, and you say to your mate, right, how good can we make this piece of code? And you compete, and you remove temporary variables. So like, if it's, if it's only being used for a second, and you're doing something else with it, you try and like, refactor the code down. And it's amazing what people can do. They can turn like, like six, seven lines of code into one line of code once they get really ingenious with it. Uh, it's quite a fun way to like, see what your skill set is. You know? It's not like they're doing anything special. They're probably just Googling different ideas of how to do stuff. But you know, it gets you in the habit of maybe thinking about refactoring. This is a really important one. It's don't ignore the movement of the trends in our industry. Uh, it is moving quite fast at the minute, and it, it is easy to say, OK, I'm not going to do that, which is also fine if you want to put one aside, but you still have to keep current. You know, I would kind of describe this as like, there's things like Gulp out there now. There's things like Composer. There's things like SAS and all that. Um, it's OK to leave one out. Don't leave them all out. You know, if, if you're starting a project and uh, there's like six things to learn. If you can remove one or two of them, and it makes you be able to start the project, do that. Because at least you're learning some new stuff. But if you learn all six, you might melt down and just say, I can't do this project. And once you give up on something, like you know, if you were learning React and you give up on it, you'll never come back to it. So if you have to do a bit of bad, bad React to get started, then that's the way forward. And to go along with that is to just enjoy the benefits. This is like, you don't need to know what, how stuff works under the hood. This is a little bit like the feeling overwhelmed. But in a good way, like you can, you can just follow the tutorial blindly. Like you follow every single step, and if you can get Gulp or Run or Composer running, enjoy it. Just enjoy the fact it works. You don't ever need to look underneath it. I think our jobs have enough to learn now that like it's okay to not know every single component and how it works. So let, just give yourself a break. Just say like it's cool. I use I use Gulp. I I use Run. I use loads, loads of tooling. Uh, luckily in our office we have people like Mark and stuff in the, the front end team who know all how that stuff works, and they kind of just help me out. So. I, I get away with it, but you can do that too. But you can good, do good tutorials out there, or getting help from one of your friends. So, if we're going to apply these to an actual project, um, I'll kind of walk you through roughly how I would do it. This is Prison Architect we worked on recently, which is um, it's like sold like two million copies on the PC, and then they were making the console edition, which is I think it's in like preview at the minute. Um, and they came to us and said like. We want to build a website, and it should have all some game data. Like we want to share some prisons, some stats about how many prisoners are where and what they're doing. And I was like, this sounds really cool. And then they're like, well, we also want a character builder where you can build your own character, and you know, they can submit that into the game. And they want a single sign-on system. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. I'm not like totally sure off the top of head what I'm going to do. They came to us because we're a WordPress agency, so we knew how to use WordPress. But in what way? You know, did we need some other tool to support it, or what was going to happen? So. What I do is I, I, I sit down and pick a platform. And this is the six piece, because this is just your preparation. And I always ask myself, does this new platform that I want to use? So in this case, I was going to use React. So I was like, does it, does it fit the project? Is it likely to be maintained in three years? Can I find a good learning resource? Do I know someone who uses it? Pretty simple questions. And the reason being is that, you know, to fit the project is an obvious one. It needs to fit it. The second one is you, know, you don't want to start picking a tool that's going to get, obviously, stopped being used. And you should find a good resource that you pay for because it's worth, worth it. And you might have someone to contact you for questions. Knowing someone's great as well, or if like, it has like a Slack channel or something like that, that's good. So in my React case, um, it's an API-driven site, so that's perfect for React. There was going to be the WordPress data source. There was going to be the game data source. There's a possibility in the future the PC would have a separate data source from the console. And I was like, definitely suits it. You know, This is definitely like a React-style site. Uh, Facebook have been using React since 2011, so I was like, I'm pretty keen that they're not going to just stop supporting their own website. Um, Resource-wise, there's a React for Beginners that we paid for. I think it was really cheap, and it was just a load of videos. And even if videos weren't great, it was just, it was some way for me to start. I could sit down for one day and just watch videos to learn how React kind of works. And it came with a Slack channel, which I, I assume is actually better maybe than knowing someone, because I was able to pester someone I'd paid, you know, for a stupid question. And it happened a couple of times. I'd, I'd done some of the most dumb stuff in the first two days of doing React, but I had someone help me out, and it was great. From that, you know, you don't want to ignore these industry trends. So how I do this is starter kits. So you can search for a starter kit for anything. You could do it for WordPress, do it for React, do whatever tool you want, Angular. Um, I, use, I use GitHub, so I'll just type it in. I basically look for, you know, 250 stars and above kind of packages. It just means that they're sort of well supported. You know, something that's actually being used by other people. And off that, you know, you can't have too many issues. So I always say around about 5% of the, of the stars should be issues. And that's just a rule for me. You don't have to keep to that 100%. But you don't want to end up with something that's broken. By doing this, uh, this allows you to just find a kit and all the tools that are being used at that time. So then you can say, like, oh, it looks like most React developers right now are using Webpack. 
It's as simple as that. And you have proof of it, and you have the implementation written in front of you. So for React, I found these. So that's the one, the top one's the one that we got with the course. Uh, and the bottom two are just, well, the bottom one's the automatic, uh, so the new tool that they wrote for using WordPress. And I only done that because I wanted to figure out what the standard, like what's the go-to React standard for WordPress. Now, if they develop one that I should be following, uh, and it came to like it was quite quite complicated. And I didn't really like it. Also, has a serious amount of bugs. Um, so you know, this React start kit in the middle is the one that I end up going with. And I just dissected it. So anytime I had an issue, I'd try and find out what they did. Now, if you're if you're going to enjoy the benefits and set up the tooling, I still recommend following tutorials. But you're going to have a working example of how to do it. Find a tutorial and try and do it yourself. You've got enough sort of data sources to figure out how stuff works, and that's the whole idea. Just Sit there, don't copy it right away. You can copy it in the end if you need to, but this way you're learning a little bit more, you know. And it'll be cleaner, because if you set up yourself, you're gonna know just enough that if it does go wrong, you can probably tweak it a bit. Because the problem is if you directly copy it, you won't actually know how to tweak stuff. And then for React, what I found was like Webpack and Gulp are pretty standard these days. I understand them enough that I use them. Uh, Babel is like AS6, that's like near JavaScript stuff. I didn't have a clue how that worked. Uh, Mark done that for me, so I, I call Mark a tutorial. Um, and Redux is like uh, it's a, it's a way of storing data inside, um, like a state container inside React. Um, I looked at the docs and it scared scared me, so I didn't use it. Um, it turns out that it was a real shame I didn't use it, and it was a bad decision on my part not to. But I stick with the fact that if I tried to learn Redux with React at the same time, I probably would have given up. That's the point. Uh, and this is the tidy home, tidy code side of stuff. Um, I think this relates a little bit more to your editor as well. It's like getting, you know, your your sign it, you know, your highlight and your theme set up, your shortcuts, your editor config, those type of tooling. You know, it's weird. Like if you spent half a day just configuring an editor, they'd be better for that one project. You save yourself so much time. And what I mean by like just little things like shortcuts, like and it's just like random, gift, but like it's these little like um, you know where you can just like tab to create like an entire class or whatever. It's this kind of stuff that you need to be able to start doing. Now, I'm quite lazy at this. I still use my mouse a lot as well, you know, and a lot of developers try not to. But I mean, just finding all the snippets for whatever code editor you use saves you so much time. Like, if you can save like five minutes every hour, it adds up over time, it does. You know, it saves you just like doing stupid stuff or making mistakes because you won't make a mistake in that because it's been pasted in. And the editor config, I don't know if many people have seen these, they're really simple principle. And if you're not using one currently, you should, which is just literally how many spaces a character can code and that kind of stuff. And you can pretty much just Google like WordPress editor config and you can get one. So if you're not, that's an extra step. But basically, the reason for editor configs is that if you pull it down the, the code that I've just written and you don't have an editor config, there's a good chance the two editors are configured differently. So like if they both commit bits of code, they're going to be like indented differently. And that's a really easy mistake. And so if you want to keep it tidy, Put one of these in text two seconds. Or, you know, you can always quiz me, I'll show you what we use at Big Byte. Now, I, keeping it simple is like the workflow, in my opinion, for this set. It's just like how you can deliver assets to clients. Um, I know everyone's different at different, different areas in, in here, and some people might not use and use and get, or some people might not be deploying for Git. But if you're not, like, this is just my go to thing, and I know some people are like, I've been doing this for 10 years or whatever. But, like, Everyone here should be really considering Git and having like a local development where you can just have like client.app and you can push that to like a staging site and you can push that to a live site. You know, that's the workflow you need to figure out. And if you set up at the beginning, it's a lot easier because if your client comes to you halfway through the project and says, oh, can I view something? You're going to go from coding to trying to set up an environment. That's a really bad mix. You should get it all done out of the front. And the reason I say this is like, there's still people out there using FTPs to code and like we had an agency in our building come down to us in a panic about a site going down. And they code over FTP, so they had no local site. And I was like, I'll help, but you've got it over FTP. So like, the first step was just trying to figure out how to get the site set up locally. And, and obviously, there was no way then to redeploy any changes back onto FTP properly. So it was a complete mess. And so they had like at least a day of downtime just because they hadn't put these practices in place. And this is probably my biggest secret for like development. I think this is the best idea you can come up with. Um, I don't worry, we're nearly finished. We're close to getting to the pub. Um, this sample file idea, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit embarrassing, but it's like, before I start a project, I create a little sample file. And in my sample file, it's like my brain dump. It's like, Bleh, this is what I'm going to do. It has, just has like some like ideas behind like how I would write an if statement, how I would do this. So like, if you want to check what, how a variable is empty in JavaScript, you, you might not know off the top of your head, but like, you could probably find it out within two or three minutes. So do it, paste it in, keep it, right? 
Now, doing all these little micro decisions, because you might, you might find four or five ways of doing something, you'll need to make a conscious decision which way to do. Do that before the project. So when you're in the project and you're trying to solve a big problem, you're not thinking about stupid stuff like, how do I check is this variable empty? You should be focused on the overall problem, not the little bits. Now, you know, you'll, you'll keep coming back to this a lot. Um, I'll just show you like a quick, quick version of this. You know, it's not obviously full, because it's hard to fit a whole file on one slide. But it's just something like this here. It's like, that's how I do my React class, which is actually the old way, because that's what I prefer doing. Um, and that'll be me using like load ass to check if something's empty. And that's all it is. Like, that doesn't take very long, you know. But if you spend a day doing that, you're going to save yourself a lot of time. And now, just to recap, it's a bit of a big slide. This is what you need to do. You need to accept that it's OK to struggle. Have we agreed with that? Yeah? Right. And then you need to learn to ignore others. And you need to plan your projects. And then you need to keep your code simple. I'm reading this off because I don't remember it. Um, take your time to make sure things work, which is obviously keeping stuff tidy. Ensure your code's tidy and consistent. Make a start, even if it's a silly one. That's just the poof stuff. You know, you've got to give it, give it some sort of start. And embrace refactoring. And don't know, ignore industry trends and enjoy the benefits. And I think that's just like my motto for guilt-free coding. And then hopefully this talk's giving you a couple ideas of what you should be doing. And uh, feel free to reach out, though, on Twitter if you need, have any questions. Thanks for having me.